representation of the functions, right? So do you remember in the beginning we started with the problem of calculus, right? Basically we say that in this course we would like to understand in this course we would like to understand the relationship between the derivatives and the integration. And we've considered a couple of examples, right? We said, hey, if my velocity is given as a constant, right? So it's kind of a constant function. For example, at the point 60 kilometers per hour, then every hour my velocity is the same, is the constant. One, two, three, four. And I can draw the function of the distance. So which will be a linear function, right? So after one hour, we will be at the 60 kilometers. After two hours, we'll be 120, 180, and 240 kilometers. So we say that the slope of this line, the red line, tells us the velocity, right? And in order to calculate the slope, we just need to take two positions on the, uh, of the distance and divide this to the time, right? So the slope of this line can be calculated by delta s, right? Divided to the delta c. Okay, so now I just would like to give you some insight about like uh, why we need the slope. So let's say if my line is looking like this. So what do you think? Is the slope is positive or negative? Positive. It's positive, right? And do you remember in the example, in the second example yesterday we've considered? So there was a line which looks like this, right? And what was the slope? Negative. Negative, right? So we say that car is moving forward with some velocity v, right? And car is moving backward with some negative velocity, minus v, right? And the distance, line of the distance will be like this, right? For this case is positive, right? And for this case is negative. So why I'm doing this is the So if the line is horizontal, what will be the slope? From the distance and the velocity perspective, okay? What does it mean? That over some time, right, time is going, right? But the distance which you have traveled is the same. It's for example 60 kilometers here, and no matter how the time is changing, the distance is the same. What does it mean in terms of the velocity? What is the velocity? Zero. It's zero, right? Or, yes, is zero. So it means that the slope of this line is zero, right? Do you remember? So we said that the slope of the line, which shows it's the distance, tells us the velocity, right? If the line of the distance is horizontal, it means that over the time, the velocity is zero. The distance is not changing, right? If after one hour, you've traveled 60 hours, 60 kilometers, sorry. After two hours, you've traveled again to 60 kilometers. After three hours, 60 kilometers. After four hours, 60 kilometers. It means that your velocity is equal to the zero, right? So that is why the slope of this line is positive, the slope of this line is negative, and the slope of this line, the blue line, is zero. Right? Yes? Uh, it's not zero, it's constant over time. Uh, the distance is the constant. Distance is the constant. Right? So this is distance. S, we're talking about the distance, right? And T. So distance is the constant, right? It means that the velocity is zero, right? You're not moving. After, no matter how the time is changing, the distance traveled is, a, is the same. So it means that the velocity is zero. Is that, is that clear? In which cases, the, what does it mean roughly, the slope, right? So if your line is looking like this, the slope is positive, right? If the line is looking like this, the slope is negative. If the line is horizontal, the slope is con zero, zero, sorry. What about the vertical line? What, what does it mean? If, for example, at the, at the time which is equal to the three, the graph of your distance function looks like this, right? What does it mean? It means that at the time three hours, for example, your distance which you've traveled is equal to the infinity. 
right? So that is why uh, your velocity is also infinity, right? Okay, it means that for such a functions, okay, with the vertical lines, the derivative doesn't exist. Okay? Because we say that the slope is the same as the derivative, right? Okay. Now, <coughs> let's consider this function, this kind of function, okay? I would like to try to understand how to find its maximum or minimum. Okay? So if I start from here and we'll go along this curve. So what is the slope here? Is some positive number. Is it positive here? Yes. Positive, 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 positive here? Zero, right? Then it comes negative, 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 and so on, right? So if my line, if my curve looks like this, for example, then again, the slope here is negative, right? Yes. It's becoming negative, negative here, zero, and positive, positive, and so on, right? So what kind of conclusion we can make from this? So how we can find the minimum and the maximum of the curves? Hmm? Point would change from negative to positive means a minimum of the function. Means a, means when the point changes from negative to positive, and when you go over part to the negative, uh, mm? From the positive to the negative? No, no, any, any, anything. So any maximum or minimum. So what does it, so if you are on the maximum point or in a minimum point, the slope is equal to the zero, yeah. right? So basically we need to find all the points for your curve where the slope is equal to the zero. Do you understand this? So all in this point we can get the, I mean, and the borders of the interval as well, but here we can have the minimum and the maximum points, right? So how we need to look for them? How we need to look for, so let's say you're given some function f of x, and you don't know its shape, you don't know what, what, what is its graph, but still you would like to find its maximum or minimum. If you can draw this, it is easy, right? You can just draw this and see where is the maximum and where is the minimum. Here, I cannot draw this by some reasons, but still I would like to find its maximum or minimum points. So what I need to do, what kind of axis I need to look for? So, do, do you understand what does it mean? Y is equal to the f of x? Y is equal to the f of x, it means Right? Do you remember yesterday we discussed the functions? For some value, so for every value after x, there is a correspondence in the y. Right? For example, like this. For example, your function is like this. So I need to look for the x so that your function become maximum, the highest point of your function, or the lowest point of your function. For, for what kind of axis I can look for? I need to look for. So which axis I need to search? So how I can find the maximum or minimum? Taking the derivative and one to zero. Look at the y. Huh? I need to look at y? Okay. I mean, here the problem is you don't know what is the graph, okay? So basically, I need to look for all possible values on the x line, right? Where the slope of the line is equal to the zero. Right? This might be a maximum or a minimum. Right? And yesterday we said that the slope of the line can be found by taking its derivative, right? Derivative of the function. Basically, we need to look for all possible axes where the derivative of this function is equal to the zero. Right? It basically means that we're looking for all possible axes where the graph of the function has slope is equal to the zero. Okay? So these things are equivalent. Do you understand this? Okay. So this is what we're going to learn after a couple of weeks. So uh, basically, the slope of the line can help us to find the maximum or minimum. Okay. But for for now, we just need to understand that like a slope of the line is zero if your line is horizontal, and the slope of the line is negative if the line looks like this, and positive if the line looks like this. So let's do a couple of examples of finding the slopes. So let's say our function is given as 1 minus tx. How to find a slope? Yeah. 
So, uh, so far, officially, we don't know what is the derivative, right? So that is why you cannot just take its derivative and tell me the slope is minus 2. Right? So do you remember yesterday we said slope of the function right, at some point or in some interval is equal to the change of your function divided to the change in its argument. Right? Do you remember? So the slope of the distance, the line of the distance was the change in the distance divided to the change in time. For the, where the s is the function of the distance, which depends on time. Right? Do you remember this? In the very first example. So here is the same. So if your function is given like this, I need to choose two points on the x line, right? And I need to find the difference of your values of the function and divide it to the difference of the axis, right? So let's choose x to be equal to the 6 and 7, for example. So x1 is equal to the 6, x2 is equal to the 7. So we still need to calculate f of x1 which is 1 minus 2 multiplied to the 6, which is what? Minus 11. And f of x2 is equal to 1 minus 2 multiplied to the 7, which is minus 13, right? Now by just plugging everything to this formula, we will find f of x2 minus f of x1 divided to the x2 minus x1, which is equal to the minus 2, right? Yes, so minus 13 plus minus 13, uh, minus, minus 13 which will be plus, uh, sorry, 11, it will be plus 11 divided to the 1, right? It will give you minus 2, okay? Could you please tell me what is the slope of this function? The f of x is equal to 4 plus 5x minus 6. So what is the slope? Do the same thing, like you take two points, for example, 6 and 7, evaluate the value of the function, find the difference of the values of the function, and divide this to the difference of its arguments. Alright, so let's choose x1 to be equal to the 6, x2 is equal to the 7, f of x1 is equal to simply 4, right? Because if I substitute the 6, it becomes just 4 multiplied, uh, 4 plus 5 multiplied is a 0, f of x2 is equal to the 4 plus 5, which is 9, right? If I plug this to the formula of the slope, it will be f of x2, which is 9, minus f of x1, which is 4, divided to the x2 minus x1, which is 1, it will be 5, right? But if you remember how to take the derivative of the polynomial, the derivative of this function was 5, right? Right? Because all the constants will vanish when you take the derivative, and the relative of that function was minus 2, right? Okay, do you roughly understand what, what we're talking about? The slope of the line and the derivative, okay? So it is really important, do you see? So uh, if you understand, if you know how to take the derivative of the polynomials, it's good. But if you understand what does it mean, the derivatives geometrically, you could, for example, come to the idea that you can find the maximum or minimum of the curves using the derivatives. Right? Because you understand that derivatives mean the slope. And you also know that the derivative, uh, the slope here is equal to the zero. It means that you need to find all the points right, where the derivative of the function is equal to the zero. It means that find all the points where the slope of the curve is equal to the zero. Okay? Let's do one more example. So let's say we're given a function for the velocity, which is equal to the 10, where the t is from 0 to 1 over 10. And the velocity is equal to, or let me write this differently. Is equal to the 0 if t is more or equal to the 1 over 10. Okay? If you're given that your starting position or at the point zero, you've already traveled one. Could you please figure out what is the function of the distance? 
Okay? You're given the function for the velocity. So let, let us do this first of all. Okay, so for t from 0 to the 1 over 10, what's the velocity? It's 10, right? It's 10. And after 1 over 10, what is the velocity? Zero. It's 0. So the function, the shape of the function looks like this, right? So now I need to figure out what is the shape of the function for the s of t. As the t is equal to the 0, what is the s? It's 1, right? Okay. So, do you remember yesterday we discussed, we say that the area under the curve of the velocity will tell us the distance, right? Do you remember? So, if you travel with a constant velocity 60 kilometers per hour for four hours, then the total distance which you traveled is 240 kilometers, right? We need to find the area under this. So, what is the area here? Hmm? As the width of this rectangle, which is 1 over 10, multiplied to the heat is 1, right? The area is equal to the 1. So basically, after this amount of the time, after 1 over 10 hours or seconds, I need to travel 1 kilometer, right? So, okay. And since the velocity is the constant, my, so it should be it. Right? So, do you remember? So, distance which I have traveled at the point zero is equal to the one, right? And I know that after one over ten hours, I have to travel one more kilometer, right? Because the area here from for the t from zero to the one over ten is one, right? So it should be at the point two kilometers, right? And how? What is the shape of the function here? So how I need to connect one and two? Was the circle? Or was a line, or with some curve. So why was a line? Because it's a constant linear equation. Because the velocity is the constant, right? So since the velocity is the constant, the amount of the uh, distance which we travel changes linearly, right? For example, if you travel with constant velocity, 60 kilometers per hour, then the amount of the distance, right? is changing linearly because after one hour you will travel 60 kilometers, after two hours you will travel 120, after three hours 180, linearly, right? And what happens after this? How the distance changes? It doesn't change, right? It will be always here at the t, right? Because the velocity is equal to the zero. So you will stay there. After you travel two kilometers, velocity becomes zero, right? You stop the car, for example, right? And no matter how many, t how many hours you will sit there inside the car, you will be still there, right? So the distance doesn't change us. So what will be the shape of the function of the S of T? Okay, for t from z 0 to the 1 over 10, this is equal to something, right? And for t is more than 1 over, 1 over 10, it is equal to the 2, right? So I need to end the distance from 0 to the 1 over 10, it should be 1 plus something. Plus what? Hmm? Plus? 10t, right? Because if you substitute, for example, the border, the 1 over 10, it becomes 1, and then in total it gives you 2, right? Which is equal to what? To the integration of the function, right? So your velocity function has, is v is equal to the 10, right? If you integrate this, it should be what? 10t, right? Plus some constant, plus c. This is our constant, okay? So by integrating the velocity, we will get the distance. And by taking derivative from the distance, we can find the velocity. Okay? 
Good. Now, we will come back to this later on. So let's, dis let's continue discussing the transformation of the functions. So yesterday we discussed um, what happens if I just add or subtract the numbers to the function, right? Do you remember? So what happens if you have the graph of the function? What happens if you add or subtract the constant to your function? And what happens when you add or subtract some constant to the argument, right? Do you remember? Can you can you can you tell me? Can you remind me how it changes? Yes. In the first equation, if we add constant, it goes up. Okay. If we subtract, it goes down. Okay. In the second case, if we add, it goes to left. If we subtract, it goes to right. Okay. So let's do a couple of. Can you give me any function? We'll test this here. <coughs> let's take square, x squared. Y is equal to x, x squared. Okay, can you see the function? Yes. Okay, so now I would like to draw another function, right? Y is equal to the x squared plus 2, right? Okay, you see, so the new function, the blue one is just shifted your, your green one to the two units upward, right? If you subtract the two, it will go down to the two units, right? Right? So the same function is shifted downwards for the two units. Okay? So now, if I just add the two to the inside argument, what kind of function I will have? Hmm? Mm -hmm. So basically, if you add the two, right, it will be f of x becomes f of x plus two. Right? So since you are su substituting everything in the left hand side with x plus two, you have to substitute everything in the right hand side with the x plus two as well. Right? So what kind of function it will be? X plus, two in the square. X plus two in the square, right? X plus two in the square. Okay? You see the red one is shifting, or it is the same function which is shifted to two units to the left, right? When you add the number to the argument, it shifts left, okay? And when you subtract the number from the argument, it shifts to the right. <coughs> You see this? Okay. And there are two more operations with the transformation. It is when we multiply a number, a positive number, or divide a positive number to our function. Okay? So let's call this vertical and horizontal. Stretching. So all of the thing is needed for us, for example, you basically, most of the time you know how to sketch the graph of the like a ordinary standard functions, for example, sine, cosine, or the parabola, or hyperbola. But when I add some constants or multiply the constant to the standard functions, then like a, you need to at least know what is, what is the shape and how to, how to draw this by knowing these rules, by shifting or stretching the function. So if you have the function f of x, x and y, and if you multiply this to some constant c, so let's say let we have a constant c more than one, then this is stretching, stretch, the graph of y is equal to the f of x vertically by a factor c. If you just divide your function to the C, then it shrinks the graph of y is equal to the f of x vertically by C. Okay? If you multiply the constant, it will be shrinked, uh, uh, sorry, stretches. When you divide a constant, it will be shrinked, okay? 
So let's see this in our example again, right? So now, instead of multiply, instead of adding the two to our function, what we'll do is we will multiply this to the two. Okay? For example, if I multiply the x squared to the two, right? It becomes. Oops. Over t. Okay, yes. So the, the green one is our, our function, okay? y is equal to the x squared. So if you divide this, it becomes, is it, is it, is it stretching? I think, yes. Yes? I think, huh? Stretching is become wider. Yes. I think so, yes. Yes, so it means that in our defini definition it's vice versa, right? If you multiply a constant, if you divide a constant, then it stretches, right? It becomes wider. If you multiply the constant, it becomes narrower, right? Shrinks, sorry. Okay, so can you give me another example? For example, let's do this with the trigonometric functions. So let's say I would like to do this with the sine of x. Okay, this is sine of x. If I multiply the sine of x, does it here? So it was correct, I think. Yes? It was correct, sorry. Stretches. Okay. Because, for example, if I put 4, then it becomes like this, right? Okay. And if I divide this to the 4, <coughs> becomes like this. Good. Okay. Sorry. If you multiply this, it becomes wider, right? But like it, it is written that it, it, it runs wider vertically, right? Okay. So we need to look vertically. And if I divide this of our function to some constant, it becomes more narrow, but we need to look this vertically, okay? So what happens if I divide or multiply the argument? If y is equal to the f of x multiplied to the c, then it's Do you remember how it worked before? So if you have a function, right, and if you add some constant, it kind of behaves logically, right? It goes up. Or well, if you subtract the constant, also like, like logically, it goes down, right? But with the argument, it works vice versa, right? If you add the number to the argument, it goes left. But I, so logically, it would be kind of like it goes right, right? Logically. And if you subtract the constant, it goes right. Yes? So here is the same. So if you multiply the constant, it's kind of logically it should be wider, right? And if you divide some constant, it should be more narrow. Right? But we, we're talking about vertically, right? Not horizontally, but vertically. So if you multiply the argument to some constant, then it becomes more narrow, right? Shrinks the graph horizontally by C, and it stretches the graph horizontally by C. So let's see this one more time with the sign. So what I need to do here, how I need to change my second function? So 4 should be here, inside the sign, right? If I multiply the x to the 4, it should be what? It should be? Huh? 
more narrow, right? You see? So this is the green one in our sign, right? If you multiply the argument to the four, then it becomes more narrow, right? Horizontally. Do you understand this? If you multiply the function itself to the four, it becomes wider, vertically to the four. Okay? If you multiply the four to the argument, then it becomes more narrow horizontally. Okay? The same as if I would divide the four x to the four, then it should be what? It should be more wider horizontally, right? You see, so it is wider horizontally like four times. Okay? So it works with any of the functions. So you just we just need to write this down. Okay? Any questions? Are you sure? Okay. Well, let's talk about trigonometry then. Review of trigonometry. Hmm? We finished what? No, no, we didn't finish the function. Trigonom we will talk now about the trigonometric functions. Okay. Review of trigonometric functions. So do you remember how we de defined a function, trigonometric function? Using unit circle, right? But we define the uh, trigonometric identities using the uh, right angle rectangle, right? So we said, hey, if I have the rectangle with a right angle with the sides A, B, and C, then obviously we have the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, right? So it tells us that the uh, A squared plus B squared is equal to the c square. Okay? Then we define the trigonometric ratios. We say that the sine of alpha is the ratio of the opposite side, which is what? B, B divided to the c, c hypotenuse. And the cosine of this angle is the ratio between the adjacent side, right? Which is A divided to the C. And what is the tangent of alpha? It's the ratio of the opposite side, right, to the adjacent side. Do you remember this? It will be B to the C. And the cotangent of alpha is the ratio of the adjacent side to the opposite side. Right? Oops, A, A. It was A. <laughs> okay. So now, the problem is, like for the triangles, this angle is restricted, right? So most of the time we work with the angle until 90 degrees, right? Because of like, or until 180 degrees, let's say. But when, the, the, when this alpha becomes more than 180 degrees, then we cannot build the triangle, right? So that is why we need to move to the unit circle in order to define the functions, trigonometric functions, which would work with any angle. Okay? Alpha, which is more than 180 degrees as well. Okay? I think we did this previously. Do you, do you remember this? Yes. Okay. So we said, I would like to draw the unit circle. Right? Was the ra so what does it mean, the unit circle? It means that the radius is equal to the 1, right? So let's choose this point, or this point, for example, right? So what do you think, what are the coordinates of this point? Or the, let's start with this one, more easier one. What are the coordinates of this point? X and Y coordinate. What is the X here? Zero. That's 0, right? And what is the Y? One. It's one. Okay, so this is not a good idea as well. But let's start with this one. So, s some coordinates, okay? So, let's say x and y, okay? If I do the right angle triangle, then I can measure this angle, right? Somehow. So, what are the sides of the triangle? What is the side? It is x, right? And what about this side? It's y. Why? Because of the coordinate of the spine, right? Do you remember? We need to draw the coordinate 
or the points in the coordinate system by just going like x units to the right, right? And y units to the up, then we just need to find the intersection point, right? So since this point has the coordinates x and y, then the size of the triangle should be x and y here. Do you understand this? Right? Because in order to draw this point, x and y, what's the coordinates x and y? I need to go x units to the right and y units to the up, right? Yes? Okay, for example, if the x is equal to the 1 over the square of t, and the y is equal to the 1 over the square of t, it means that the size of the triangle is r 1 over the square of t. Right? So, by the way, why, why it is 1 over the square of t? So, if I choose, like, exactly middle of this quarter, so y, x, and y becomes 1 over the square of t. Because there is a measurement 45 degrees. Uh, okay, so I would like to exactly get the measurement of the 45 degrees because of this is 1 over square of t. You know what I mean? So this is not 1 over square of t because it is the measurement of the 45 degrees. I would like to find, evaluate the like a sine of 45 degrees because of this. Okay, so since it is right in the middle, I know that it should be right angle triangle where the two sides are the same, right? So this side it should be equal to the x and this side is equal to the x. And how about this side? What is this side? Is equal to 1, right? Why? Because this is the radius of the circle, right? So I know that x squared plus x squared should be equal to the 1 in the square, right? From the Pythagorean theorem, I know that the this side in the square plus this side in the square should be equal to the this side in the square, right? Can I find the x from here? Yes? Okay. So 2x squared should be equal to the 1. So that is why x is equal to the 1 over square of 2. Okay, so I take this positive. Okay, so that is why if I choose the point here, right in the middle of the, this quarter, then the coordinates of this point should be 1 over square of 2 and 1 over square of 2. Okay, 1 over square of 2 and 1 over square of 2. Okay, do you understand this? So now, I'm going to use this coordinates of this point in order to figure out what is the sign of this angle, okay? So this is x and this is y, this is 1, okay? So according to the rule, what is the sign of this angle? So sine of alpha is equal to the y divided to 1, right? Basically, sine of alpha is equal to the y, right? So that is why sine of 45 degrees is equal to 1 over square root of 2, okay? This is the reason why sine of 45 degrees is equal to the 1 over square root of 2, not vice versa, okay? Because the coordinates of this point are 1 over square root of t and 1 over square root of t. Huh? Give me something cancel. Uh, okay. So what about the cosine? Cosine of alpha is equal to what? Minus 1 over. So it is adjacent side, right, which is x, right? I'm talking about this triangle, right? Adjacent side, x divided to the 1, which means x is equal to the cosine of alpha. So that is why 1 over square root of 2, or cosine of 45 degrees, is also equal to the 1 over square root of 2. Okay? Yes? I can now change this alpha as anything as I want, right? For example, I can change this to the pi over 2 until 90 degrees, or pi until 180 degrees, or even more than 180. For the triangles, I couldn't change this, right? Okay, so it appears if you are given the points on the unit circle with some coordinates x and y, right? So if you would like to measure the angle on this unit circle, so the sine of the alpha is 
is actually the y coordinate of this point, and the cosine of the alpha is x coordinate of this point. Okay? Because of the definition of the, tri of the trigonometric ratios, right? So now we can evaluate the sine and cosine for many angles. Okay? For example, if I choose this part, If I choose this uh, point here, what will be the coordinates of the point? Zero, one. Zero and one, right? If I travel from here until this line, what will be, what will be the angle? 90. It's 90 degrees, or if you talk about the radians, it will be pi over two, right? Do you remember we say like a so overall revolution around the circle is equal to the two pi, right? This is the definition of the radians. Right? Okay? So, that, I mean, there is a relationship between the radians and the degrees. So we said overall revolution around the circle is 2 pi, which is equal to the 360 degrees. So that is why pi is equal to 180 degrees. Okay? Good. So, Prior of the circle will be pi over 2, right? Or 90 degrees. So at the 90 degrees, I would like to evaluate what is the sine and what is the cosine, right? According to this formula, right, the, the cosine of the pi over 2 should be equal to the x coordinate of the point. What is the x coordinate of the point there? Of the red point? Zero. It's zero, right? So that is why cosine of pi over 2 is equal to the zero. What about sine of pi over 2? is 1 because this is the y coordinate of the point, right? So let's move a little bit more, for example, to here. Okay, what are the coordinates of the point? What is the x coordinate? Minus 1, right? Because how do you know this? Because we are on a unit circle, right? Uh, okay. So minus 1, and what about y is equal to the 0, right? So what is the angle from starting from here until here is? 180. Pi, right? Or 180 degrees. So the cosine of the pi is the x coordinate of the point. So what is the x coordinate of that point? Minus it's minus 1, okay? And the sine of pi is equal to the y coordinate of this point, which is equal to the zero. Okay. If I move a little bit more until here, so what are the coordinates of this point? Is x coordinate is zero and y coordinate is minus one, right? And how I need to move? So how many degrees? What is the de what is the angle? Is three pi over two. Right? So I know that according to this formula, which is really important formula, the sine of 3 pi over 2 is equal to a y coordinate, right? What is the y coordinate? It's minus 1. And the cosine of 3 pi over 2 is equal to the x coordinate, which is 0. Okay? Then we'll come back to the beginning, right? To the origin. At the origin, it is 0. Oops. Is it zero and zero? One zero. Sorry. It will be one and zero. So what is this angle? Oops, it's impossible to do. To undo. So the angle is either zero or the two pi, right? So the sine of two pi is equal to what? To the zero, right? Or the sine of zero is equal to the zero. And the cosine of the two pi is equal to the x coordinate, which is one. Or the cosine of the zero is also equal to the one. Okay? So now, so what I will do is like more and more revolutions, right? The values of the sines and the cosines will be similar, right? For example, why the value of the sine is equal at the point zero and the two pi? Because it's made to 
one for rotating. Okay. Like you do. It means that they are periodic, okay? So I just would like to understand. So from the from the like a concept of the sine and cosine on the unit circle. And if you look to the graph, it like uh, same. I don't know what is the graph of the sine so far. For example, officially. The period it uh, continues again and again, like okay. the same shape, shape doesn't change. Okay. I mean, from the idea of the sine and cosine on a unit circle, why the values of the sine and sign becomes the same in the two point zero. The coordinates of the points are the same, right? Yes? So you are at the point at the coordinates one zero, right? After one time revolution around the circle, you're again there, right? And obviously the sine and the cosine will be the, will be the same, right? For example, you are in the zero and one. You do two times the revolution around the circle, right? But you will be still there in the, in the same position, right? The coordinates of this point will be the same. So that is why the values of the sine and the cosine will be similar after some period. Right? After some revolution around the circle. Okay? So that is why once we know the values of the sine and cosine from 0 to the 2 pi, then we can generate this for other values of the angles. So now let us try to figure out what is the graph of the sine and cosine. So before doing this, let me just write down the table for the sine of alpha and alpha. So when the alpha is equal to the zero, it is zero. When this is pi over two, it is one. When this is pi, it is equal to the zero. Three pi over two, it is equal to the minus one. And two pi against zero, right? What about cosine? Cosine of alpha and alpha. So when the alpha is equal to the zero, it is equal to one. When the alpha is equal to the pi over t, it is equal to zero. Pi is minus one. Three pi over t is zero. Two pi is equal to the one. Right? Okay, let me just put all the points there in order to draw this. So I need to put pi over t, pi, three pi over t, and 2 pi. Right? So if I draw the sign, so in the beginning it is 0, and the pi over 2 it is 1, and the pi it is 0, the 3 pi over 2 it is minus 1, then it becomes 0. Right? This is the value of the function. This is our alpha. So it should be like this. What about the cosine? So by just putting the value, so the cosine of the alpha is equal to the zero is one, and the pi over two is zero, and the pi is minus one, and the three pi over two is zero, and the two pi is one. Right? Okay. And we can continue in this direction when the alpha is negative. So how I can find the value, the values of the sine and cosine when the alpha is negative? How we can evaluate the values of the sine and cosine when the alpha is negative? I just need to go in reverse direction, right? Yes, in this direction the alpha becomes negative. Right, do you remember? If you start from Q in the counterclockwise direction, then the angle is positive. If you start from Q in the clockwise direction, the angles are negative, right? You, we, will, we still just need to go in this direction, to this point, to this point, to this point, for example, right? And we can evaluate the values of the sine and cosine at the negative angles. Okay, so now, one more thing. So do you remember, so sometimes we need to know where the, in which quarters, do you understand what, what does it mean, the quarter, yeah. right? So one, two, three, four. In which quarters the sine and the cosine are positive or negative? Okay? So in which quarters the sine and cosine are positive or negative? Positive, or well, let, let me make it this kind of table. So the sine, cosine, at the first quarter, at the second quarter, at the third quarter, and at the fourth quarter. Do you remember how we need to denote the quarters? 
this is the first, this is the second, this is the third, this is the fourth quarter, right? So do you remember by the definition, sine corresponds to the y, right? So where the y is positive, in which quarters? In one and two, right? So in a one and two, the sine is positive, and in three and four, it is negative, okay? So, cosine corresponds to the x-coordinate of the points, right, on the circle. Where the x is positive? In 1 and 4. Right? So this is positive here, and in 1 and 4, and negative here and here. Okay? So sometimes we need to know where the sine and cosine is positive, but even if you forget this, you still always remember that the sine corresponds to the y axis, okay? And the cosine corresponds to the x axis. Okay, so it will help you to memorize in which quarters the sine and the cosine are positive. Okay, so there are important, couple of important formulas. So now we know what the review, this is the review, right? Obviously we're not going to cover everything on the trigonometric functions. It will be like uh, some important concepts and ideas about the trigonometric functions. So why, why we need, by the way, the trigonometric functions? Is it like, is it about only the unit circle or the triangles, right angle triangles? Not only because, you know, there is a way that can also be calculated with the sine trigonometric. Exactly. So, any motion which has a, like a circular, circular motion or which has the oscillation can be explained using the trigonometric functions. Okay, so since in calculus we would like to explain many things which is going on around us, especially uh, including the waves or the oscillations, then we need to learn the trigonometric functions. Okay? And also, if you remember in the integration, there was a lot of things about the trigonometric substitutions, right? Okay, so it helps us to find the integrals as well. But, like for example, it also helps us to simulate or understand or model the circular motions. Okay? Use it. So I need the trigonometric functions in order to describe the circle motions. Okay? The waves or the oscillations and so on. Okay, so there are important formulas here, so if you are here on the x and y, so let's see, we are on the unit circle, and this is x and y coordinate of the point. Okay, what does it mean? It means that we can create a triangle with the three sides. This side will be x, this side will be y, and this side is, for example, 1 or r, right? So if this is the case, like the circle was the radius r, okay? So since this is the right angle triangle, then I can use the Pythagorean theorem and I can write r squared is equal to the x squared plus y squared, right? For any circle. Now, if I just divide everything to the r squared, what kind of quantity I have? I will have? It will be 1 is equal to what? x divided to the r in the square, right? Plus y divided to the r in the square, right? And do you remember what was the ratio of the x to the r? So what is the ratio? x to the r is the cosine of the alpha, right? Cosine square of alpha, right? And what is the ratio of the y to the r? It's sine of alpha. So that is why we have this identity, which is like a really important identity, right? Do you remember? We said that the sine square plus cosine square should be always equal to the zero, okay? So uh, it's equal to the one, sorry. So it is really important identity. What if I will divide this everything to x squared? So let's divide everything, so r squared. So do you understand where it comes from? The r squared is equal to the x squared plus y squared. It comes from the Pythagorean theorem, right? We have got, we've got the right angle triangle. Then the square, the sum of the squares of the side should be equal to the square of its hypotenuses. So let's divide everything to the x squared. What we'll have is 
r divided to the x in the square, right? Which will be equal to one plus y divided to the x in the square. Huh. So what kind of formula I have here? What is y is divided to the x? So what is like a opposite side divided to the adjacent? Is no, it's tangent, right? It's the tangent. Okay. So what about r divided to the x? Mm. It looks like a x divided. If it, it would be cosine, if it would be like x divided to the r. But since this is reciprocal, it is 1 over cosine, which we call as secant, right? Okay, so we've got a formula, like a secant square of alpha is equal to the 1 plus tangent square of alpha. Or if we divide this formula to the y square, we'll get another one. It will be r divided to the y in the square plus x divided to the y, sorry, is equal, plus 1, right? So y divided to the r looks like a sine, right? So that is why it's reciprocal is 1 over sine, or we call this as cosecant, right? Cosecant of alpha in the square is equal to what about the x divided to the y? Adjacent to the opposite is cotangent, right? Cotangent of alpha plus 1. Okay, so some important formulas which, in, which we need in order to work with the trigonometric identities. So I would like to note that it is really important to distinguish the words tangent tangent line or tangent to the circle, right? So tangent and tangent line are two different things, right? Okay, so even though we use the same word, we are going to, like, they mean different things, right? So tangent, tangent line, are two different things they mean, like a mean two different things. Let's now to write down the trigonometric function in order to introduce something which is called the amplitude or the period or the shift, horizontal shift. So let me start with the sign. So A multiplied to the sign of BX plus C. Okay? So I would like to figure out what does it mean the amplitude, what does it mean the period, and what does it mean the horizontal shift for the sign. Okay? So do you remember what is the amplitude? The coefficient before sign. Okay. So this A is the amplitude, right? So what is the period? Two by B. Hmm? Two pi over B. Okay, and what is the horizontal shift? It's C, right? Shift is C. So in order to, do, to, to understand this, let's try to make the graph of this, right? Okay, so we'll start with the sign. Okay, so this is sign, and I would like to understand 
What is the amplitude of the sine? Is one, right? Basically, amplitude is how can, how high or how low it can go, right? So you see, the sine is going until one and minus one, right? If you just multiply the sine to the two, do you remember? So according to the function transformation, if you multiply the constant to the function, right, it it becomes more wider. Do you remember? If you multiply the constant to the inside, to the argument, it becomes more narrow, right? Okay. So let me multiply this y to the t sine of x, right? So you see, what is the amplitude here? It's equal to the t, right? It, the amplitude basically means how high it, go, it is going, right? So amplitude is t. If you multiply this to the 3, it will be 3. If you divide this to the 3, what will be the amplitude? If you divide this function to the 3, what will be the amplitude? 1 over 3. It's 1 over 3, right? Okay, so do you understand the meaning of the amplitude, right? It is until which point your function is going, right? Until 1 over 3, and until minus 1 over 3. Okay, so now let's try to memorize what happens if I multiply the x. Okay, so you see, so the period of this function is equal to the t pi, right? What does it mean that if you start here, right, after t pi, you will become to the same position, right? So here, this position and this position are two different, different, right? Do you see this from the graph? Because here I'm going up, and here I'm going down, right? So two different positions. So after two pi, I'm becoming to the same position, right? So that is why the period is equal to the two pi, right? So now, if I multiply the x to some number, for example, to the two, so how the graph should change? Is it becomes wider no. because I'm multiplying this to the number? No, no it, it becomes more narrow, right? Horizontally, because I'm multiplying this number to the argument, right? Not to the function. Okay, if I multiply this, it becomes more narrow, right? And the period now is smaller, right? So if I start from here, and uh, after which time I'm becoming to the same position? Pi. After pi, right? So you see, so I'm starting from here, and after pi, I'm already here, right? After one more pi, I'm already here. Or after pi, I'm here, right? Okay, so that is why, like, according to our formula, t pi over b, so b is, in our case, is t, right? t pi divided to the t is pi, right? It gives us the uh, period, right? You see, so if you multiply some number, it becomes more narrow, so that is why the period is uh, smaller, right? Because you reach the starting point faster. So if you now divide x to the 2, how the graph should change? Should it be wider or narrow? Wider. wider, right? Because I'm dividing the argument, okay? So it works like a vice versa, right? So if you multiply the function itself to the 2, it becomes wider and more narrow when you divide this. If you multiply the argument, it becomes more narrow, and you divide this, it becomes wider, right? So it becomes more wider horizontally, right? So can we see this here? Well, let's... Okay. So I just would like to understand what is the period, right? We start there, and after this sum position, I'm becoming here, right? And what is this? Is... Hmm? 4 pi, right? The period is 4 pi. Because t pi is 6, right? Do you remember pi is 3 multiplied to the... Huh? 3.14, so, uh, right? Okay, so that is why t pi is 6.28 roughly, right? And 4 pi is 12 point something, right? Okay, so the period is bigger, right? If you divide this. Okay. If you multiply the x, period becomes smaller. If you divide the x, period becomes bigger. Okay? Vice right, versa. Okay, so that's it about the trigonometric functions. So from the next week, we will start talking about. Uh, so you roughly remember what does it mean, like how to work with the linear functions, right? And roughly remember what is the parabola.
Or do you remember? So it is like this, or like this, right? And, and now we've learned about the review about the trigonometric function. So from the next week, we will start learning the limits and like its applications. So why we need the limits and where we can apply the limits. Okay.